Good evening. My name is Susan Eckert, and I'm a member of the Hourglass Board. Before we start our question and answer, Mr. Friedman, I'm aware that some of you may have never heard of the Hourglass prior to this lecture. Others have been a partner since the beginning. We work mainly behind the scenes, providing research and analysis on community issues through forums, like this one, private focus groups, regular publications, and a very robust website. We bring together the partners and parties that need to be engaged with outside thought leaders, like Mr. Friedman, to create the conditions for informed decision making. The issues that we've been most concerned about are environment, land planning, education, and urban vitality. Lancaster County has a strong economy and an excellent quality of life. However, the world is changing and change is accelerating at an astounding rate. At the core of the strong economy and an excellent quality of life is education. Education must be reimagined for the new economy, the new world. This generation, as Mr. Friedman explained, need to be lifelong learners, capable of acquiring the skills required by the evolving employment landscape. Mr. Friedman, thank you so much for being with us this evening. That's great. And now, in the words of Willie Geis this morning on Morning Joe, it's nice to have you here because we can ask you almost anything. <laughs> Um, for the sake of the audience, in the back of your program, there's a little yellow sticky. We look forward to your questions, and there are young people from the Stone Independent School. Yes, thank you very much, Stone. Um, who will be, who are circulating, and if you just wave your little yellow sticky, they'll bring it down to us and we'll get the questions. Could they turn off that Friedman. spotlight and turn the house lights on? Because uh, that sure. would be thank you. Or thank that you. would be really nice. Wow. I swear I wasn't there. It, you know, be, there. it, it, yeah. it would be nice wow. for Mr. Friedman to know that here. there really are people in there the people audience. That's great. Wow. Thank you. So, it's totally dark. Yeah. As wow. we uh, wait for audience questions, let me start this off. So your presentation this evening and your book starts with a story about waiting for an appointment. When your acquaintance arrives, you thank him for being late, as it allowed you a precious moment to reflect and think, to listen to the others at the next table. You recommend strongly that we need and should take a pause. So how have you inserted an intentional pause in your life? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um... Well, one is that, um, so I, I don't do Facebook. If you're looking for me on Facebook, I'm afraid I'm not there. Uh, the New York Times tweets my column, and I have a Twitter account, but I don't know how to use it. My secretary uses it. So my answer to you is, is that I, I talk the talk of technology, but I do not walk the walk. <laughs> I'm actually a pretty disconnected person. I uh, know who my friends are, and they're actually not a thumb up or a thumb down. Um, they're people I talk to in real flesh and blood. I learn by talking to people, by interviewing people. I believe that I'm, uh, data is very important, and I'm as interested in data as the next person, but I think talking to another human being is also data. Hmm. So that's how I learn. And so I, uh, to put it in the vernacular, I keep it very real. I'm a pretty disconnected person. If you try to reach me after this talk, good luck to you. Um, <laughs> because uh, I just don't want to be overwhelmed by all of the noise. And there's just so much noise um, uh, in these social networks. I, I know that they provide great service in connecting people and connecting people to articles that they wouldn't have seen. They wouldn't be existing and thriving if they didn't. But um, I kind of started on a typewriter. That was a device where if you pressed a key, it created pressure on a roller. And um, 
Uh, and I'm going to kind of go out the way I came in, um, I decided. So um, I just keep it very real. Uh, I play as much golf as my wife will let me. And um, uh, other than that, I, I, um, I'm just very old-fashioned. Um, and I believe that the faster the world gets, everything old and slow matters more than ever. I think all the old and slow things, all the things you cannot download, all the things you have to upload the old-fashioned way, good parenting to good child, good teacher to good student, good priest to good flock, good bureaucrat to good citizen, all that old stuff matters more than ever, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So your book was released in 2016. It was released in paperback last fall. You likely finished writing the book two years ago. Um, would you change? Yeah, would you change anything? Delete or insert? Mm -hmm. Well, I, in the paperback, I did delete and insert. Didn't delete really much, but I uh, inserted. I I updated the paperback because I wrote the book um, during the 2016. Well, I wrote it during 2015 and 2016. Researched it in 2014, um, and so the book came out two weeks after Donald Trump was elected president. And um, uh, so a lot of people asked me, like, what, um, you know, and I wasn't writing a book about politics, but um, uh, President Trump's election was not a surprise to me because I, I was deep into the plumbing of what was going on in the country. I know how disruptive this, this moment was. So I wrote a, um, uh, uh, an epilogue for the paperback, a whole new chapter. And what it's really about is it's actually about uh, uh, the Hourglass Foundation and foundations like it. Um, that what happened was, um, as I've traveled around the country, um, uh, as the hourglass people know, I actually profiled the mother of all uh, hourglasses, which is the, uh, a group called the Itasca Project in my hometown of Minneapolis, where I got the idea. But what hourglass is, and the reason I think the country is doing well, even at a time when we're so torn apart in Washington, D.C., is the way I would describe your community, what you built here, is, so go back to my analogy of climate change, that the way to think about what we're going through now is three climate changes at once, and you want to build resilience and propulsion. So which organisms thrive when the climate changes? They're called complex adaptive organisms. Which communities thrive when we're in the middle of three climate changes at once? Those who build complex adaptive coalitions. And these coalitions, and this is where I, all I do now is speak to hourglasses around the country. I just did a tour of the state of Tennessee. There are hourglasses called Leadership Tennessee. I spoke in Memphis, Nashville, Knoxville. Then I went to Broward County to see their hourglass. Then I went to Sheridan, Wyoming to see their hourglass. Mexicali, Mexico. I just came from Copenhagen, Denver. They've got their hourglass. And what do they all have in common, these complex adaptive coalitions, is the business community is getting deeply involved in the K-12 community college and four-year college system, translating in real time now the skills, needs, and demands of the global economy, not waiting for educators to somehow be able to figure it all out. Then the Philanthropic communities coming in with supplemental learning opportunities, internship programs, after school programs, reading programs, early childhood programs. The local mayor is catalyzing this coalition and hiring recruiters to go into the world and find global investors in your local attributes. So all these communities are not sitting around praying, please, Amazon.com, put your headquarters in my town. Please, Amazon.com, put your headquarters in my town. That's a one in a million shot. Okay, What they're doing is actually saying, what are my local attributes here in Lancaster? And how can I actually go out into the world and get people to invest on those? Maybe it's your, something in your environment. Maybe it's something in the skill set. In Louisville, Kentucky, it's bourbon tourism. Who knew? But Louisville is to bourbon what Napa Valley is to red wine. They now have a huge bourbon tourism industry that they've built, along with a bunch of others. So I actually profile Louisville, a town not unlike yours in my book. But what the common denominator of the communities that are thriving around the country are those that have built or been blessed by, in some ways it is a blessing, a local leadership, very civic-minded, getting people to work together, totally apolitically, check your politics at the door, 
and building trust, because government moves at the speed of trust. And my teacher, Doug Seidman, in the book likes to say that trust is the only legal performance-enhancing drug. Yeah. Oh, when you've got trust in the room, when you've got trust in the community, you can move so fast. And when you have no, you can, it's like a hard floor. I can jump really high off this floor. And when there's no trust in the room, it's like the desert in Syria. He cannot jump a millimeter. And the communities that have got it, and there's a lot of them in our country, are thriving. And the communities that don't are in the grip of opioid crises, uh, social disintegration. And... Um, that's why, you know, kind of the cliche about America is that um, we're a country divided between two coasts, you know, two coasts that are globalizing, pluralizing, diversifying, modernizing, and then everywhere in between is flyover America, where everyone's high on opioids, voted for Trump, and waiting for 1950, supposedly, okay? Well, you only have to be from flyover America, as I am, from Minnesota, to know that's not true. The country's actually a checkerboard of communities that have built their hourglass foundations, and communities that, for whatever reason, can't. And so they can't make the transition in this age of acceleration. So you have all these communities that are collapsing from the bottom down, and some of them are right next to a community like yours that's mm -hmm. rising from the bottom up. That's the real America today. Mm -hmm. So how do we protect privacy in an open world? Um, well, the way I do it is I'm not on Facebook, and um, yeah, I, so they have none of my information, <laughs> um, you know, because uh, it really is true. I'm not, I'm not trying to attack Facebook, but, um, you know, their business model is mining your privacy, that you are um, uh, their natural resource, and the advertising companies are their customers, and, um, and the bargain is you get free connectivity through Facebook for all of that. Um, and I do my best, but I also, I don't obsess about it because you just can't anymore. You're leaving digital footprints everywhere you go, you know? So, um, uh, what I tell my kids and tell myself is, um, is be good because, um, uh, if you're not, you're leaving footprints in the digital sand everywhere you go and mm -hmm. they're just not going to get washed away. Mm -hmm. So, so much technology. What, what is changing in the role of the arts or our use of the arts? Well, um, it's kind of outside my skill set. Okay. I'm going to pass on that. All right. Um, is there a foreseeable tipping point in the conversation on climate change? I'm afraid that the tipping point is when we get a storm that's big enough to finally end all the skepticism, but not so big as to destroy the world. We're waiting for the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could tell you otherwise, but I don't see the debate changing until we have a storm that is big enough to finally end the skepticism, but not so big as to destroy the world. Um, we're, this isn't complicated, friends. Your kid is sick, you go to 99, 100 doctors, 99 tell you to do one form of cure, one tells you the other. Would you go with the one, or would you go with the 99? Mm -hmm. Do we know absolutely for certain how climate change is going to play out, we, we actually don't. That's why you buy insurance. But I can tell you one thing, if we prepare for climate change, if we do everything, carbon tax, clean energy, clean power, energy efficiency, if we do everything we could do to prepare for climate change and it doesn't come, what happens? We'll be stronger, fitter, cleaner, healthier, and smarter and have an export industry that will be the envy of the world. It'll be as if we prepared for the Olympics, and the Olympics never came. But I'm in so much better shape. If we don't prepare for climate change, and it comes, we're a bad biological experiment. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's a no-brainer for me. And um, that's sort of what I think. All right, so what should K through 12 education look like as we continue accelerating, giving, given all these forces? Um, well, I wish my daughter were here. My oldest daughter, Orly, is the um, uh, uh, acting um, uh, head of school of the Khan Academy Lab School in Silicon Valley. Um, it's a very um, cutting-edge K-12 school, which she helped design. And um, their school is built entirely on two things. Uh, one is mastery. You, you only move up when you've actually mastered a subject. It's mastery-based. There are no grades. There's no grade levels. You move up by independence level. 
So um, as you show you're more and more of an independent learner, that's how you move up. Uh, and the whole idea of the school is ownership, because if we're moving into a world of lifelong learning, then what's the single most important thing you want for your kid? That he or she feel they own their own education, and they own their own advancement. When ownership is in the room, only good things happen. A teacher who owns their own classroom, a kid who owns their own education, um, uh, people who own their own country. I'm, I live by the dictum, I didn't make this up, but I sure live by it, that in the history of the world, in the history of all mankind, no one has ever washed a rented car. <laughs> I'm a big believer in that. In the history of all civilization, no one, I know there's always somebody in the audience says, I washed a rented car once, but you get what I mean. Um, uh, ownership is the most propulsive, you know, human attribute and building education around ownership, independence levels and mastery, I think is going to be the future of K-12 education. So this is kind of a follow-up question. Sure. It's from the audience and I just want to, how do we develop lifelong learners? What message do we give those who only want to test facts and skills that will have diminishing value? And it's so it's a, it's a very good question. My daughter tells me that's the book she wants to write because that's actually the question I get most often. Yeah. And, you know, there's really, it's, it's, um, uh, we, we know one thing, you know, lifelong learners tend to be people who love to learn. And people who love to learn often get that from being inspired by, by a great teacher. I sure was. I've only taken one journalism course in my life, 10th grade at St. Louis Park High School, room 313, with Hattie Steinberg. That's the only journalism course I've ever had. Not because I was that good, but because she was that good, you know. And, um, and so inspiring your kid to be a lifelong learner is the single most important competitive advantage you can give them. But I don't think we fully know the answer to that question, but it's going to become increasingly important in coming years. Thank you. So another question from the audience. How do you suggest we bring both sides of the spectrum of universal health care and creating funding for it to come together in real life? Well, you know, I, what I would have done um, had I been in President Trump's shoes, I, I really would have said to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, when I came into office, send me your top six health care experts. I'll tell you my, send you my top six health care experts. We're going to lock them up at Camp David and tell them they can't come down until they have a plan, you know. Um, not very complicated. Um, and I think they would have if that had been the, the, um, the, the approach. I, I, I think just trying to willy-nilly take apart Obamacare without a really um, credible, tested, expert-evaluated alternative in place um, was a mistake, and that's why it didn't come about ultimately in the end. And so we have to, we have to crack this nut, otherwise health care is going to eat your pension, it's going to eat your Social Security, it's going to eat everything. And, um, and the only way we can do it is in a bipartisan manner that somehow combines merit and market forces with, um, you know, government programs. And the Swiss have figured it out so well. Um, uh, there's so many other countries that figured it out. You, you have different levels of programs. You can buy different levels of health care depending on your needs, wants, and desires. But everyone has a basic that prevents them from a cataclysm uh, of health care. It's just not that complicated, and the fact that we're still fighting over it is a shame on us. So this is another question from the audience. As a leader, owner, in an organization with multiple generations represented in our employee base, how do you suggest disseminating your, your message with clarity and an impactful way to galvanize our team to the best of our ability? It's called my paperback. <laughs> um, <laughs> Read the book. Uh, the talk I gave you here, there's many versions of it. They're all a little bit different on Google, on, on YouTube. Take it, disseminate it. I, I put them all out there for free. And um, uh, really all I can say, I only have one message. It's in my paperback. It's in my talk. That's the only way I know. So. And this presentation is being videotaped and Great. will be available yeah. on our Terrific. robust website. Great. So. All right. Um, so what is the role for governance in this changing world? 
Well, governance matters more now than ever because when the world is fast, small errors in navigation from your mayor, your governor, your president, or your corporate leader, they matter more than ever. You know, when the world was slow, if Lancaster had a bad mayor, if Pennsylvania had a bad governor, if America had a bad president, when you just needed to go 50 miles at five miles an hour, if you had a bad leader, you got off a little off track, you could get on track with really little pain. When the world is fast and small errors in navigation have huge consequences, we need to go 50,000 miles at 5,000 miles an hour. It's like having being a 747, the pilot just transposes two numbers. Suddenly you find yourself 10,000 miles off course. The leadership matters more than ever. What I've seen in my short time here, um, and I don't need to say this, and I don't say this everywhere, is that your community has been blessed by a critical mass of, of leaders who have their thinking cap on. They're thinking about what are the big trends in the world, how do we align Lancaster with those trends, and how do we come together to implement them? That's really what it's all about. But they need to produce a next generation and a next generation because it's, it, it is just going to get faster. But so leadership today matters more than ever um, in a fast world. So today, April 4th, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Do Dr. Martin Luther King. You've used your hometown and Minneapolis um, to describe how communities can create a topsoil of trust to anchor an increasingly diverse and digital population. How do you recommend that a community assures or develops a topsoil of trust? Well, you know, again, I'm going to uh, re really just repeat what I said, which is, um, you know, leadership just really matters. And the example that leaders set um, on how inclusive they are and, and how they analyze problems, how they make decisions, and how they implement decisions. Um, and you, you have to build trust um, uh, one person at a time. You can't download it, you know. Um, you, you really have to build it the old-fashioned way. Um, one community, one, one person at a time. And it's very retail. And that's the thing about this age we're in. Um, and it sort of gets to my mother nature's political party, the reason I have such a long platform. You know, in the old days you thought, we just need to get one thing right, cut taxes or raise taxes. Today you gotta get a hundred things right. Something on education, something on regulation, you know, something on, you know, investment laws. It, I wish I could just tell you, you know, cut taxes or raise taxes, it'll all be fine. It won't be. You gotta get a hundred things right, and the list changes every year. And there's no escaping that. And, you know, to be blessed with a leadership that is ready to think about that every day. When I was just in Copenhagen last week, um, the Prime Minister, they have something called the Disruption Council. And their goal is to disrupt themselves constantly. There's only five million people in Denmark. And they have some of the amaz most amazing companies in the world. You know, Maersk, Novozymes, these are cutting edge companies. And the Prime Minister invited me to come over and speak to his cabinet. And he got all the labor leaders together, education leaders, business leaders, and his cabinet. And we went to his house, and I gave this talk, and we had a long discussion. Boy, that's a country sitting there saying, what world am I in? How do I align myself in this, with this world? And how do we get more of my people aligned with this world? Unfortunately, if you look at our politics in Washington, it's really how do I take this wrench and put it in the wheel of the other party? And you know, we can only be dumb as we want to be for so long. We can only be dumb as we want to be for so long. Just waiting till we get power to put the wrench in the other guy's thing, you know. Um, uh, and, and we're gonna, China's not doing that. And China has its own problems, and China can thrive, and we can thrive together. But um, on balance, there's a lot more people there, mayors, governors, and national leaders who are starting their day saying, what world are we in? And how do we align ourselves with the world, get the right infrastructure? You know, more and more you go, you fly from Singapore to LAX, it's like, it's like flying from the Jetsons to the Flintstones. You know, I mean, that shouldn't be. We used to come to America to see the future. Now you go to China to see the future. You know, China has fast rail. Um, where my New York Times colleagues in China now think nothing of taking a high-speed train from the equivalent of New York to Chicago.
for a day, spend overnight there, and take the high-speed rail back. And now they're doing it to secondary and tertiary cities. And again, they have a million problems. I don't want to be China, but I do want my democracy to work like it should. And it's not working like it should now. Uh, it's been infected by politics. Our Congress is really just a forum for legalized bribery. I hate to tell you folks, that's what it is. It's a forum for legalized bribery. Our politics doesn't work. Our media has become completely fractionated. Now I can get my news exactly tailored to me, you know, never have to listen to anybody else. And money in politics is completely out of control. This next election, it may take a billion and a half dollars to be elected president. That's crazy. In Britain, they have six-week elections. It's by law, six weeks. It's so sensible. And so I just don't think we can continue to be dumb as we want to be. It was fine after World War II. We stood astride the world with so much overwhelming power. But the world is catching up, and it will surpass us. And we'll wake up one day, and, and, um, and we'll find out we're not so great. Not before, you know, the idea of American exceptionalism, we treat it like it's like an honorary degree. We get to put it up on the wall. We admire our, our exceptionalism degree. Look at my degree. I'm exceptional. But exceptionalism has to be earned and re-earned in every generation. And um, that's not happening. You know, I can ruin any dinner party. And, um, <laughs> I should have warned you before question time. And um, I, I do weddings and bar mitzvahs too, so just <laughs> let me know. I'm happy to come out and help you out. All right, well, this might be a time to insert this question then. Okay. Uh, would you please run for president? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, so. Um, I have been asked that before, and I give everyone the same answer. I get my aggravation playing golf, actually. I get all the aggravation I need. Um, you know, if I were younger, it might be something I would have entertained, but um, it's so rancid out there. It's so brutal. It's so unpleasant. Yeah. Um, uh, the idea of putting my family or anybody putting their family into that meat grinder now of, of, uh, of American politics, it's just so... Uh, to spend now two years of your life doing that, you know, uh, being raked over the coals. I, I have to say, it just, I'm not, I'm not running it, but it's just not, not, not appealing. But I try to, I, I'm, I'm um, completely nonpartisan in my advice. Any president who calls me, uh, anyone running for office, I'm happy to um, share my ideas with them. Um, I only want what's best for the country. But um, uh, I'm, I'm too old, so anyways. I don't think so, but <laughs> it's okay. not too old, but. So what are your thoughts on blockchain technology and how this will affect and shape the future of finance and the global economy? So, you know, um, one way to think about my theory of the book is that I think what came together, um, so I wrote a book in 2004 um, called The World is Flat. And it was about a moment when connectivity around the world had become fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous. Suddenly you could touch people who never touched you before. You could be touched by people who never touched you before. I looked at that and I said, the world is flat. In, I think a decade later, around the technologies that are this book are about, something else happened. Complexity became fast, free, easy for you, and invisible. Suddenly with one touch, think of what it was to catch a taxi in Washington, D.C. 10 years ago. Ta taxi, taxi, taxi. Taxi, taxi, taxi. Okay, I'm at 13th and K. 30 minutes! And they didn't believe it was 30 minutes, and neither did you. Now I take out my iPhone, and with one touch, I can page the taxi, direct the taxi, pay the taxi, and rate the taxi. All that complexity has been abstracted. So what's happened is that when, complex, when, when connectivity became fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous, and complexity became fast, free, easy for you, and invisible, we went through a phase change. We've taken so much friction now out of so many things, you can move everything now with just the touch of a feather. You can do all that with a taxi and so many other things. We've actually gone through a phase change. I think of it as going from solids to liquids. I think what Bitcoin, blockchain, all of these represent mm -hmm. is the next phase. Somebody else is gonna to have to write about that. But I think of it as going from liquid to gas for all of you chemistry students, okay? <laughs> that more complexity is gonna be taken out now. Mm -hmm. Now through banking and whatnot, we're just gonna take out even more friction from the system. And it's gonna get even faster. And I just wanna live long enough to see the plasma phase, so. Mm -hmm. 
So what is your prognosis for the Mideast? Oh, you I, I haven't ruined I haven't ruined your evening enough. <laughs> Um, I hate to tell you, but it's a short answer. Nothing good. Um, uh, there's, there's, I've written a lot lately about Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. I think he's the only moving object in the Arab world today. So I've focused on him because he's, he's actually a man in motion, unlike the Sisi's and the Assad's and whatnot who are frozen in place. So I think he's interesting to watch. I think it's interesting to see if he can do what to me would be hugely important which is moderate Saudi Islam, which has had such a big impact on global Arab uh, and, and Arab Islam. Uh, when you think of how much money we've spent countering radical Islamic extremism since 9-11, what he is doing from the inside of Saudi Arabia is hugely important. So I'm hoping he succeeds. Not predicting, but, but hoping. He's about the only bright spot I see, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, that thing is so broken. Um, uh, I, I see zero hope of any progress whatsoever. Um, and, um, yeah, I wish I could be more, more, more optimistic, you know, but I used to tell a joke, uh, you know, a long time ago about Israelis and Palestinians that really is relevant today. There was a, this very religious Jew named Goldberg, and he would um, uh, try to win the lottery every week. And he would do it by going to synagogue every Friday and Saturday, and pray to God, God, what would be so bad if I won the lottery? The lottery would come, and Goldberg wouldn't win. He would do this week after week, month after month, and finally one day Goldberg goes to synagogue on a Saturday and says, God, what do I have to do to win the lottery? And the heavens parted, and the voice of God came down and said, Goldberg, give me a chance. Buy a ticket. So, <laughs> so when you see Israelis and Palestinians buy a ticket, um, you'll know we're going to have progress, but right now it's no, nobody's buying a ticket. They're all just looking to blame the other guy. All right, one more, and that is what? What do you think is most important for our children? And I'm going to change it a little bit, but preschool, elementary school, junior high, or high school? Well, let me. This will be the last one. I'll, I'll end on this if I could, because uh, I get this question a lot, which is, um, what do you tell your own kids? So I have two daughters, one's 32, one's 29. Um, uh, my, my youngest daughter is the executive producer of All Things Considered Weekend Edition on NPR. And, um, uh, um, and so I, uh, I've been telling them this for you know, three decades and they're really tired of it, but you're fresh meat, so I'll try it out on you. <laughs> um, so I basically tell my girls um, uh, five things. Um, first, girls always think like a new immigrant. How does the new immigrant think? New immigrant thinks, I just showed up here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and there's no legacy spot waiting for me at Franklin and Marshall. Mm -hmm. I better figure out what's going on in this community and pursue those opportunities with more energy and vigor than anybody else. I have an Armenian friend who likes to say, uh, new immigrants are paranoid optimists. They're optimists because they came from somewhere bad to somewhere they thought would be better, but they're paranoid it can be taken away from them any second. Always think like a new immigrant, I tell my girls, because we are all new immigrants to the age of acceleration. Secondly, I tell them, think like an artisan. I got this idea from Larry Katz at Harvard, a labor economist. Who was the artisan? The artisan was that person in the Middle Ages, before mass manufacturing and factories, who made every item individually, every item one-off. Every shoe, every dress, every belt, every saddle, every chandelier. Every fork, tablespoon, and knife, and plate, the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisans do? They took so much pride in their work. They brought so much human extra to what they did, they carved their initials into it at the end of the day. Do your job every day as if you wanted to carve your initials into it at the end of the day. That's a job that won't be easily outsourced, automated, or digitized. Uh, third, uh, I tell them, think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley. I got this idea from Reid Hoffman, the founder, co-founder of LinkedIn. Uh, Reid likes to say in Silicon Valley, there's only one four-letter word. Actually, it's not four letters, but it does start with an F. And that word is finished. If you ever think of yourself as a finished product, you are indeed finished. Mm. 
Reed's motto is always be in beta. What is beta? Beta is the stage of a development of software where it's about 85% done, you throw it over the wall, the community tests it, they find the holes, they find the glitches, they throw it back, you work on it some more, you throw it over the wall again, they test it some more, find more glitches, find more holes, they throw it back over the wall again. Reed's motto is always be in beta. Always be in that style and mindset of learning, relearning, lifelong retooling. Never think of yourself as finished, because if you do, you really will be finished. Fourth, always remember that CQ plus PQ is always greater than IQ. You give me a young person with a high curiosity quotient and a high passion quotient today, in a world where you can learn anything online, I'll take them over the kid with a high intelligence quotient mm -hmm. seven days a week. CQ plus PQ will always trump IQ. And lastly, lastly, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, <laughs> my favorite restaurant. So um, when I was working on my last book, I was again home in Minneapolis having breakfast with my best friend Ken Greer at 7 a.m. at Ker Perkins Pancake House. Uh, on France Avenue and uh, Highway 100, 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. And Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And after 15 minutes, the waitress came back. She put our two plates down, and all she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit. I gave her a 50% tip. Why did I give her a 50% tip? Because that waitress didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. And that was the source of her extra. What was that waitress doing back there in the kitchen? She was thinking, I got these two yokels at 7 a.m. They're the only ones here. I think I'll give them an extra dollop of fruit and see what happens. That waitress, in her own way, was thinking entrepreneurially. Whatever you do, whatever job you have, always think entrepreneurially. Where can I fork off and start a new business for three people, four people, seven people? Fork off there and start something else. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, friends, please remember this. Always think like an immigrant and stay hungry. Think like an artisan and take pride. Think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley and always be in beta. Remember that PQ plus CQ will always trump IQ and always Always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis. And be relentlessly entrepreneurial, because this little Minnesota boy can tell you, we all really do live in Lake Wobegon, yeah. where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children need to be above average. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, it's right. Yeah, that was dangerous. <laughs> Thanks very much. So the honor. <laughs> thank you. The hourglass has been very honored to have Mr. Friedman here tonight. Uh, we could not have provided this forum without the generous investment of our partners. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Home Sale Realty, IU13, ERC, Lancaster County Community Foundation, the Mann Family Foundation, Monty and Molly Milner, Worley and Obitz, the United Way of Lancaster County, and an anonymous donor who offered us an initial challenge grant to make this possible. So I need to do a few brief, very brief, thanks. My, our thanks go out to the Stone School for bringing their students here and helping with the audience participation. We'd like to thank Millersville University because they offered us the Ware Center for a reception prior to this. And we really must thank the Fulton Theater because this is a glorious place to be able to bring um, a international speaker like Mr. Friedman and allow us to learn more. And finally, this doesn't happen without an active board. So thank you to the Hourglass Board and in particular, thank you to Jennifer Mundy 
who has been gifted at organizing, etc., including renumbering this, the chairs, as you may have noticed. Um, so Mr. Friedman looks at complex issues and never throws up his hands in disgust. Instead, he pokes at the accelerations and challenges of the workplace. Elected officials, individuals, and communities. And he challenges us to embrace the opportunities that change provides. Don't forget, thank you for being late is an optimist guide to the accelerations of change. And we as Hourglass are optimistic about the remarkable community in which we live, work, and play. But it will be through our collective understanding, trust, and optimism that we learn to slow down, take a pause, reimagine our work, our education, our politics, and our community. Thank you so much for attending tonight. Please, we welcome your thoughts on this forum. But for now, good night and safe travels.